Welcome. Uh, I think it is time to start this uh, lunchtime uh, symposium uh, sponsored by Keystone Heart on the latest developments in cerebral embolic uh, protection. Uh, my name is Andreas Baumbach. I'm here with my co-chair Alexander Lansky, panelist Joachim Schofer, and we will hear talks from Tamim Nazif, uh, uh, Michael Wosquil, and Holger Thiele, all people involved in the embolic protection field. Um, let me start with a statement which I just found very appropriate uh, at lunchtime uh, after three days of meeting, and that is, we need all the brain cells we have. <laughs> we can't afford to lose any of those. Now, for the longest of time, there has been this debate raging, which uh, sometimes was rather strange, of people saying, well, it's actually okay to lose a couple of million brain cells. It doesn't show. The patients don't mind, and if you don't look hard enough, you will not have any damage found when you do TAVI without anything to protect the brain. This is a long story. This is a long story, a journey of more than 10 years, starting with the detection of brain lesions, uh, following interventions, particularly TAVI, and then the attempts to prove that with the appropriate protection, uh, the appropriate device in place, you can actually reduce the number of hits and the number and the amount of brain cells died and hopefully, maybe, uh, can reduce the clinical amount of stroke uh, as a risk and as a side effect of TAVI. This session is dedicated uh, to an update on the field. Let me ask you a question before we go on to the fantastic speakers. In the room, we see a lot of interest, which is great, and I'm sure you're not just come for the lunch. Who of you in the room are using cerebral embolic protection in some cases? Who in the room would say are believers in cerebral embolic protection and would like to use it in all cases? Okay. Is there anyone in the room that uses it for all the cases? Wonderful. We've got a fantastic mix which should make for a really great uh, discussion. So, without further ado, I will hand over to my co-chair to introduce the first talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andreas. That's a great introduction. I agree. After three days, we definitely need all our brain cells. I'm struggling. So, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a great colleague, Tamim Nazif, who's going to who's actually the PI for the REFLECT Phase two in the United States. This is the IDE clinical <laughs> study. And he's going to give us a background on the whole field and an update on the clinical study. Thank you so much, Alexandra. It's a real pleasure to be here. I thank uh, the organizers as well as our sponsors and friends from Keystone Heart. As Alexandra mentioned, I'm going to begin with a brief update regarding the state of knowledge with respect to stroke after TAVR. I think by nature of the fact that you're in this room, many of you will agree with me that stroke remains an issue even in the contemporary TAVR studies. We see an average rate of about three and a half percent. But we know very clearly from the literature that the actual stroke rates are likely much higher. In those studies with routine evaluation of patients by neurologists using the AHA ASA definitions, rates of almost 10 to 27 percent or more. And there's also sobering data recently from the TVT registry showing that while increasing TAVR experience is generally associated with better outcomes, increasing site volumes were not associated with a decrease in stroke. So I think this is still a real problem and one that's likely to stay with us. With respect to the clinical consequences of stroke, we know that periprocedural stroke after TAVR is associated with substantial adverse outcomes, including a three to four-fold increase in mortality. We also know from the neurologic literature that there are other important adverse effects on things like physical functioning, cognitive function, and psychosocial function. And beyond overt clinical stroke, a multitude of studies have now shown that the vast majority of patients after TAVR have new cerebral lesions that can be identified by DWMRI. And again, in the neurologic literature, we know that these so-called silent infarcts are associated with future stroke, mortality, 
and things like dementia and cognitive decline. And I think it's important as we look at this data to take into account the goals and desires of our patients who are seeking TAVR. Many of us as physicians in the TAVR field focus on mortality, but this beautiful work by Megan Colwright and colleagues shows that the patients are much more interested in maintaining an excellent quality of life, things like the ability to do a specific activity, maintaining independence and so on, all things that can have um, a dramatic uh, decrement in a patient who suffers a stroke. Now with respect to the timing of stroke after TAVR, this is work from Partner, but other data sets have shown the same. The majority of events are periprocedural, occurring at the time of the procedure within the first 48 hours. We believe that this is due to the liberation of embolic debris, which can occur at every stage of the TAVR procedure. And it was shown in the Sentinel trial that this is not just thrombotic, or like we usually tell the patients, calcific debris. Rather, it's a whole host of different types of material, even concerningly 35% with foreign material. And as we start to think about different cerebroembolic protection devices, it's important to emphasize that all of the vascular territories are at equal risk for embolic insult. Also, as we speak about cerebral protection and trying to select perhaps the most important uh, uh, markers or the best patients who should be protected, although substantial work has gone into risk factors, there are no risk factors adequate enough to help us choose those patients at most risk for periprocedural stroke. So let me turn then to the Keystone TriGuard family of cerebral embolic protection devices. I've shown the first generation TriGuard device here and the newer TriGuard 3 that we're studying now. These are very similar in principle of operation and intended use, namely their cerebral embolic protection devices that are entered from the contralateral femoral arterial access. They're advanced to the aortic arch, they're self-expanding devices that allow a filter to be placed across the cerebral vessels, uh, therefore deflecting debris away from the brain during a TAVR procedure. Now there have been important iterative engineering advances with respect to the TriGuard 3 that have enhanced its generalizability, its ease of use, and so on. And some of those I'll show here. The TriGuard 3 filter unit is a self-expanding nitinol frame. It's self-positioning and self-orienting in the arch without the need, for example, for stabilizer bars like were present in the first generation. It has a peak mesh with smaller pores, and it's threefold larger than the first generation device. There have also been important uh, improvements in the delivery system. There's now an eight French integrated sheath. This allows for entry as well for the pigtail catheter through a dedicated side port. It's a nitinol shaft with a very soft uh, rubbery tip that can be delivered in over the wire fashion. And there's a very easy delivery and recapture just by moving back and forth the handle. I'll show an animation then of how that works for clarity's sake. Again, the newer generation device is over the wire. The sheath, which is integrated into the system, is simply advanced up past the anominate and then withdrawn, allowing for deployment of the filter unit. It covers all three head and neck vessels. The pigtails enter through the same access point. And we then have the TAVR device advanced from the contralateral access. Any debris now liberated will be deflected away from the brain. The TAVR device can be removed and the filter unit very simply recaptured. Now, I won't belabor the preclinical testing, but I want to just show one experiment to uh, just demonstrate the rigor with which these devices are being tested. This is a particle counting system or efficacy simulator. It's a flow simulator that models the physiologic flow patterns of left ventricle and ascending aorta and a three-dimensionally printed uh, aortic <coughs> arch with the cerebral branches. The particle counting system itself is an optical system with a high-speed camera and rapid imaging processing that allows real-time particle counting and size uh, classification. In these experiments, particles of varying sizes from 200 to 300 microns, consisting of either air bubbles or solid particles, are entered into the simulator. You then count how many reach each of the ascending cerebral branches, both with and without the TriGuard device. We see in this experiment very impressive efficacy in the model 
of preventing the embolic debris from reaching the cerebral vessels. I'll move then to the Keystone clinical studies beginning with U.S. NeuroTaver. This was a registry study to set benchmarks led by Dr. Lansky, 44 patients undergoing unprotected TAVR in the United States. It demonstrated that stroke as defined by the AHA ASA criteria were very common, 22.6% at discharge, and that the MOCA score is an important surrogate for cognition, got worse in nearly 40% of the patients after TAVR. This led into DEFLECT-3, again led by a number of people here in the room, the first randomized study of cerebral embolic protection. And it was randomized to embolic protection with the original TriGuard device versus unprotected TAVR. This demonstrated that deployment success with this device was 93.5%, and successful positioning with complete three-vessel coverage throughout the procedure was 87%. This clearly demonstrated safety of the device and showed an increase in freedom from ischemic brain lesions, as well as a reduction and worsening of neurologic and cognitive outcomes as measured by the NIHSS <laughs> score and MOCA, respectively. And finally, this is pooled uh, analysis presented by Dr. Lansky again at PCR here in 2016, showing important clinical uh, uh, advantages to protection with the TriGuard device with respect to stroke, worsening of NIHSS or MOCA, and DWMRI lesions. So this set the stage for the REFLEC trial, which I'll speak about now. This is a trial that took place in two phases, a prospective, single-blind, randomized, multicenter safety and efficacy trial. In the first phase, we tested TAVR with and without cerebral embolic protection with the TriGuard HTH original device, a two-to-one randomization scheme. And in the second phase, implemented the new improved TriGuard 3 device, again with a two-to-one randomization scheme. I'll show the primary endpoints for the phase two, very similar to phase one. The primary safety endpoint is combined VARC 2 defined safety endpoint at 30 days, including the components listed. And this will be with a non-inferiority test in the as-treated population versus historic performance goal. On the other hand, the primary efficacy endpoint is a hierarchical composite compared by the Finkelstein-Schoenfeld method of death or stroke at 30 days is the top tier, NIHSS worsening, post-procedure, freedom from DWMRI lesion, and total volume of DWMRI lesions. We designed this to have very broad inclusion criteria. It essentially enrolled any adult patient undergoing TAVR with a commercially approved device for symptomatic severe aortic stenosis, only excluded alternative access TAVR, valve and valve, and very few clinical exclusions, including recent stroke or TIA, very significant kidney disease, or inability to get an MRI. The anatomic exclusion criteria were more significant with the first generation device, but were really dramatically pared down due to the generalizability of the TriGuard 3 device. And in this phase two, it was only severe peripheral arterial aortic disease that would preclude delivery of an eight French sheath or a very heavily calcified, severely atheromatous, or severely tortuous aortic arch. And all of the cases were analyzed prospectively by a CT core laboratory prior to enrollment. And I think this speaks to the generalizability of this device that more than 90% of all cases were allowed <coughs> through the anatomic screening committee. We've now completed Enrollment in this, a total of 478 patients with two to one randomization. This means more than 250 patients that underwent protected uh, TAVR with either the HDH or the TriGuard 3. And a complete analysis of the data for all enrolled subjects is currently underway and should be completed soon. I'll finish then by just showing a quick couple cases to give you a sense of what this is like for the operators. You begin with a pigtail shot to demonstrate the cerebral vasculature, advance the device in its sheath up into the ascending aorta. I show this just to, just to make the point that the frame, the night nitinol frame of this device is highly visible by fluoroscopy and multiple projections. This is what it looks like as you deploy it. Again, it's a very simple motion of just moving your hands together on the back end with that handle, unfurling that filter, across the ascending cerebral branches. And you see it there. 
once it's fully deployed. Pigtail is also placed. And then the tavern device crosses beneath the filter in a smooth single motion. It's much easier to use relative to the first generation device for those that have experience. Once you're done, you simply remove the tavern device as you ordinarily would, remove the pigtail, and then you recapture the TriGuard 3 by simply pulling it back, again using the handle, into its delivery sheath. You can then remove it entirely and you're left behind with an eight French sheath that you can use, for example, for crossover angiography or anything else you want. I'll show one other example, again, just to demonstrate the versatility. This is an Evolute R case that I did. Again, you advance up and over the wire fashion and deploy it very simply by withdrawing the delivery sheath. And again, you see how visible this filter unit is. You then cross the pigtail catheter beneath as shown here. And you see how much more easily you can identify this. Oops, we missed a. And then here's the Evolute R being advanced up and over, gentle traction on the wire. Nice. You see there's really, in this case, very minimal interaction with the filter unit. Once that's completed and the valve is deployed, you withdraw in the usual fashion. Once again, go ahead and capture the TriGuard device. So I'll stop there and summarize by saying the TriGuard 3 new design offers complete coverage of all three cerebral branches like the original, but there have been important design improvements that optimize the safety, efficacy, ease in use, and generalizability of this. There have been 478 patients enrolled in the Reflect Pivotal Clinical Trial, and the analysis is underway, and we hope to have results for you very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much for that update. I think that's great. You laid the foundation and the stage, et cetera. Don't, don't go away. I've got a couple of questions. Oh, you can come up here. That's fine. Okay, great. So um, my question to you is just going back to, you know, we've looked at these rates of stroke over time, and we found a relatively constant rate, right? And then we had the low-risk patient populations that have just been presented, right? And in particular, partner three, where all of a sudden we see a massive drop in the actual stroke rate. There were different ways um, that those were assessed in the clinical study, and I'd just like you to comment um, whether you think truly there is um, you know, a drop in stroke rate with the lower risk patient, patients, or do you think that's just sort of an ascertainment uh, difference? You know, I think it's probably some combination thereof. As you mentioned, it was lower in partner three uh, with the core valve study. There was still this three, three and a half percent uh, rate of all stroke. Um, you have to be careful looking at the presentation of all these trials. Frequently, major stroke or disabling stroke is what's emphasized, so we have to look at all stroke. Um, but also the ascertainment. We know very clearly as shown that if a neurologist is not routinely seeing the patients, um, it's very easy to miss more subtle strokes. So, you know, I think it's probably fair to say that in um, low-risk patients, patients that are very low risk for TAVR, they probably do have a somewhat lower stroke rate, but it's certainly not zero. I'm sure if they have routine adjudication by a neurologist, it will be higher, and I'm sure if you do an MRI, you will still see cerebral debris. So, you know, you do hear that argument. Some people say, well, the stroke rates are down 1%, who cares? I, I would argue counter to that, that I would suspect if we did MRIs, the majority of these patients still have cerebral injury during these procedures. So, so I'd love, you know, everybody to weigh in. Do we, do we think that low-risk patients should be, you know, considered for cerebral embolic protection? In, when we look at our database on uh, MRI after um, TAVI, we have a uh, I think a, a patient cohort of um, more than 700 now, uh, there was no uh, correlation to any of uh, those variables like uh, type of valve, uh, degree of calcification, uh, risk of the procedure. So you, you have an equal distribution uh, of um, new lesions um, over the whole cohort of patients and an incidence of about 80%. 
So I think this is a strong argument uh, to use cerebral protection in, in all the patients because we do not um, be able to identify any risk factor for stroke. Yeah, I think um, I was about to ask a question, so I, I may combine that with a, with a comment on that. Um, I think it's true, A, we cannot identify, we, we have some high risk features, of course, you know, but normally we cannot tell which patient will have a stroke, and the big strokes are so bad, even in a low risk patient, that is something that must be avoided if we can. Let me put that into a question. We also know that not all strokes are exclusively exclusively down to emboli. They are, particularly in the more elderly population, they are new onset of atrial fibrillation. At a later time, they can have a stroke. So it's very difficult to get the stroke rate down to zero. What we want is we want no strokes during the procedure. That's what we probably can achieve. I, I turn to, the, um, to Holger. And just a thought, what kind of evidence do you think is required to not only convince our colleagues and us to use embolic protection, but also convince institutions like NICE in the UK to say, yes, that is an important uh, tool and uh, will eventually be cost effective because it is systematically reducing stroke. What kind of evidence do we need? So I will cover this in my talk. I hopefully will cover this in my talk. And if you ask me, I'm, um, we still have to really um, convincingly show in a large-scale randomized trial that we really can reduce um, clinically um, stroke. So looking for um, diffusion, diffusion-weighted MRI, I'm not fully convinced if this will also be something, a tool to convince NICE like um, in the UK and maybe also we have the same problem in Germany in um, getting a reimbursement for this. Sure. And maybe this point um, me back to your introduction, you did not ask who is not using cerebral em embolic protection in any patient. So this is maybe also an open, because many probably also sitting here in the room, they don't get a reimbursement for it and that's the reason why they are not able to use yep. it, although they would like to use it. So I think, well, to answer straight away, I, I didn't ask that question because there's a mix. There's a mix of, of uh, colleagues that may not use it in everybody uh, uh, because they don't believe in it, and then there's a majority, me included, that can't use it in everybody because we still not have uh, reimbursement. But let, let's go back, then I'll, I'll ask Alexandra. Isn't it the case that we do have, over and above the evidence that we've, this is still the evidence talk discussion, over and above that we have of our series, um, we do have meta-analysis, we have other studies. Do we have enough evidence to say, well, we at least believe that embolic protection makes a clinical impact already? I believe so. Yeah, I think, I think we do. I mean, the, the evidence is being built. There's no question about that. But nothing beats, of course, a head-to-head -head comparison of protection versus no protection, um, you know, and showing a reduction in clinical stroke. And I think for issues of reimbursement, which are obviously critical because, you know, as I understand it, less than 10% um, of centers are actually using it uh, in patients. I think if we want to see this used in the majority of patients, we're going to have to have reimbursement. And that's going to, whether it's in Europe or in the United States, we're going to have to have clear evidence of reduction in stroke and health economic uh, analysis and, and benefit. I, I completely agree and you know um, I'm doing correct stenting since 20 years uh, and using um, cerebral protection systems without any clear evidence based on randomized data that this is makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have evidence, we've seen the evidence, it's been building up, you know, there are believers, non-believers, but I think it's a strong indication that what we're doing here is, is the right thing, but there is a need for the big trial. But there was also always a need to improve what we have, and uh, we now are in a new uh, era with a new device, uh, the TriGuard 3, and I, I asked the next speaker, uh, Mikhail Vosquil, um, who was fortunate enough to get his hands onto this new device to show us uh, some EU experience with the TriGuard 3 CEP device. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the kind invitation and uh, thanks to the organizer also to uh, let me tell you some of the experience we've had um, in Utrecht in the Netherlands uh, as a first center, first in man study in Europe uh, and also present this presentation on behalf of my colleagues Dr. Stella and Dr. Kreierveld. Um, so this was just a first in man study, single arm, uh, single center uh, to investigate um, the safety uh, of this new device um, and we were only uh, designed to enroll 10 subjects uh, with all subjects undergoing uh, clinical and magnetic resonance imaging in the hospital before discharge. The primary performance endpoint was the device performance of course defined as successful device deployment, positioning with complete uh, uh, coverage uh, of all three uh, cerebral vessels and also uh, important retrieval without interference with the TAVI procedure. The primary safety endpoint was in the hospital device related safety uh, and then composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, stroke or bleeding. Um, so important secondary endpoints included in hospital major uh, adverse cardiovascular events and imaging endpoints uh, as done with uh, MRI two to five days after TAVI before discharge. The primary analysis uh, was done with the intention to treat population uh, defined as all patients enrolled in the study. And an additional analysis of the secondary endpoints was performed in a per protocol uh, population. So this is actually quite uh, simple, of course. 10 patients were included uh, with 100% follow-up and unfortunately two patients denied MRI uh, being too fragile, too anxious to undergo once more this investigation after TAVI. Um, so the patient population I think was about average, uh, I think intermediate to high risk patient population with an immediate uh, uh, mean age of a uh, little over 80 years old, predominantly male patients, uh, and I think so 20% of diabetics, 50% uh, of hypertension, I think you will recognize this patient population from this. Two out of the 10 patients had a stroke previously and one patient had a prior TIA. Um, so I think that's also important to see that this is a true risky patient population, which I think deserves uh, prevent, uh, prevention of a second event or a first event in the other cases. Um, so all type of procedures in our center are done under conscious sedation. In the meantime, we're doing more and more procedures also uh, with only local uh, anesthesia, but these 10 were done with conscious sedation and involved implantation of an Edward Sapien 3 valve to keep it a little bit homogeneous. Uh, and we use uh, in almost all of our cases intracardiac echo guidance. <coughs> Balloon predilatation was only performed in one out of 10 cases, uh, being really calcified valve in which we thought uh, predilation would help us uh, to prevent any problems. Uh, mean fluoroscopy time was about 18 to 90 minutes, and the mean contrast given was uh, 136 mils, and that's, I think, because we in general use a 3D rotational angiography to estimate the true perpendicular view for our valve implantation. And of course that costs uh, uh, somewhat 30 or 40 mils more than normal procedures. The axis was in 100% transfemoral uh, and the triguard was uh, done through the left uh, iliofemoral uh, artery. Um, and I think uh, this is really an important slide uh, because uh, uh, we show that also uh, as I said before the froscopy time did not went up so it did not cost uh, we compared with previous patients it did not cost us a lot of extra time I think about three to four minutes extra for our procedure to do uh, to include the cerebral <coughs> protection device uh, and of course we do ACT check in all of our patients um, this is I think for the operators, of course, important. How does the device perform? And I must say, having also experience with the first generation device, this really changed, uh, a game changer, so to say, uh, in the sense that it's really easy to prepare 
uh, really easy to uh, to deploy in the yard, and we'll show also uh, some images in a minute. Um, uh, and in all of uh, almost all of the cases, it was really easy to uh, position it. In that case, that all three cerebral uh, vessels are protected, so you have full uh, protection uh, of all vessels using this case. And I think that's really important uh, to to have such a device doing that. Uh, unfortunately, in one case, we only had partial uh, uh, um, protection, and uh, well, it was striking that this one case we saw an MRI had really larger emboli compared to the other other nine. So, no, of course, statistical conclusions can be made after it, but I think it uh, stresses the need for full coverage of all arteries. Um, happily enough, we did not have uh, any uh, safety issues uh, being uh, stroke or bleeding or kidney problems. No, uh, all patients survived uh, without any problems. Um, and only we had one patient with a uh, uh, vascular complication at the exercise site of the TAVR, not at the exercise site of the uh, protection device, which was uh, treated with, uh, with a covered stent without uh, sequelae. Um, so this is then, we looked also, with, uh, uh, apart from uh, checking the, the device uh, performance, looked at the MRI data, uh, and of course this is uh, fully not randomized still, and just compared for the, for the time be being with the, the Sentinel, uh, uh, published Sentinel study of uh, 2017, um, and well, at least we have an hint that the, the device is doing pretty well, maybe even better compared to uh, the Sentinel data from 2017. But of course we have to await uh, further uh, studies being really randomized. So this is just to show you the case, and you've seen uh, previously also by Dr. Nazif, a nice case, I think. So it's pretty easy and quick to, to advance the, this eight French uh, uh, sheath. And then um, on the right panel you see the deployment, the de-sheeting of the device, which is really easy. I don't show, they did not show you the, the, the angio we made, so we make a 3D rotational angio and do a check normal aorta uh, angiography before deployment to be sure to cover all three cerebral vessels um, uh, in the proper way. So deployment is easy, then you can uh, uh, insert the pigtail, and of course this is, well, not difficult, but an important phase because you have to be sure that you're really un uh, under the device, and that's why I think a quick check in an REO view, which costs you like 10 seconds, is important to really uh, show that the device is well, nicely positioned, and that you, uh, that you will be under the device also, when you come later with your tower, of course. Um, what helps you to keep the device nicely in position at the outer curve of the aorta is to have the wire, stiff wire, in the right coronary cusp and to push the device with the stiff wire. Uh, and also, you can, the, the pigtail can help you later on against the outer curve of uh, the aorta, as shown in the, in the right panel. Uh, uh, and I think that's, that's uh, really important to have a really full coverage uh, and preventing also interaction with the type of a type of device later on. So here's uh, the case with the uh, with Sapien 3 valve crossing uh, the device and I think you really can see the nice position with the nitinol frame as I previously stated already and I think you can also appreciate how easy the, the sapien valve crosses uh, this uh, um, device with any, without any interaction. Uh, uh, and that's really, again, I think really, really different from the first generation, uh, which was uh, easy to deploy, but difficult to keep in position at the right location, particularly passing with valves. So that's a major improvement, I think. Well, it's, of course, important for the patient to show that in this case, the, the TAVI result was really nice. So you see in this case, I think really nicely, the fully uh, instrumentation of the patient in this case. So you see the intercardiac echo device uh, in the right chamber. You see the pacing lead still in the chamber, and you still see the uh, protection device and the pigtail in place. So that's nice, but I think the important thing is also to have a safe retrieval. And for that, it's important not to forget to first retrieve the pigtail uh, uh, out of the patient 
which is really easy as you can see and then uh, subsequently retrieve the device itself uh, which is really uh, uh, quite easy as you can see also over here so in conclusion, conclusion ladies and gentlemen um, I think the TriCard 3 is really an improvement compared to the first generation um, and with only limited experience with this team patient, 10 patients I think we have some promising uh, outcomes, at least with no neurological problems, and maybe looking at uh, the MRI data with, uh, with a small glance, uh, we might have uh, the next promising generation preventive device for stroke. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, Michael. That was great. I mean, a superb illustration of the step by step and what's needed to actually, you know, keep the the device well positioned, and the data is great, right? So ten cases, but mm. really outstanding. So I guess my question is: Do you are there any any limitations in the types of patients or anatomies in terms of selection criteria for the device? Yeah, I think that's, that's an, an excellent question because especially uh, we've had also had some experience with the Sentinel device, which in majority of cases is quite okay if you're an experienced operator. But I think with this device, well, almost all anatomies uh, being gothic arches, having a lot of calcifications, should not be a problem uh, using this device. Um, so, yeah, only having the limited uh, uh, experience with 10 cases, but... I think also theoretically you should not have a lot of exclusions for this uh, device to be honest unless for excess be, being the excess side mm. on the other side not uh, being large enough for an eight French sheet or whatever but I think in majority of cases you can still use it. Do you think uh, there's a need for any specific workup before uh, where you can base your decision on using it or not or is it just uh, you, you using the routine CT as you do for all target cases. Yeah, so I think you again the, the exercise should uh, be should allow you to use an eight French sheet. That's important, but that's why we have the CT scan indeed. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I, I would not know of any anatomical reasons not to use it. So, I mean, we have the three D reconstruction of the CT. We make the rotational angio on top of it, but I think you would not even need it. I mean, we use it as a standard care also before we use this device, uh, but... Uh. Yeah, I would agree. Again, in the core lab uh, experience from Reflect, uh, several hundred patients and the screen uh, in rate was over 90%. Uh, every now and then you find a patient and it was usually vascular disease in the iliofemoral arteries or the lower mm. abdominal aorta with, with just, you know, really bad peripheral vascular disease that led to exclusions. Um, in very tall patients or patients with, with uh, excessive tortuosity, you also have to be careful of the reach of the sheath, and, and a longer sheath is being developed as well to deal with that issue. But well more than 90% of patients will screen in. So basically when we, when we started thinking about cerebral embolic protection, somebody said the ideal thing would be to have a device that you pop in at the beginning of the procedure. It doesn't cost more than five minutes, stands, stays there reliably, uh, you do your procedure and then you remove it. We're pretty close with that. So you can confirm it takes not more than five minutes to put mm. it in, in most cases. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. So there's one, uh, one question I have from your presentation, and that is this one case where you say partial protection. How does partial protection work, and is that something you can avoid when you know it? Uh, it's a good question. So um, I think the device being larger than the first generation prevents, I think, in a lot of cases that you have not covered all vessels. So I think the most important thing is that you have to be sure that the device is uh, deployed symmetrically in the aorta and that it's not turned or whatever. I think that's one of the most important things that you should be aware of also inserting the device, that it has not rotated or whatever, um, which will cause uh, yeah, malalignment of the, of the device. But yeah. We didn't have any problems of that. And in the one case we had the metal lamp, I think we were just not proximal enough. So it was a very proximal <coughs> innominate artery. Although we made the check with the with the with the angel, we're just not proximal enough to, to cover it fully. Mm. 
Okay, so it, it wasn't uh, that the device went went behind, no. uh, or the, the, the Tavi device went behind, it was just simply yeah. sort of too short and you didn't yeah, yeah. quite so recognize that at the yeah. time. Okay, that's easy then. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, that was great. So let me invite Holger Thiele, who's going to tell us uh, about what's next here in Europe. We're excited about this. Holger. Oh, yeah, yeah thank you very much. So to get out of it. So we just heard that um, not everybody is fully convinced to use it in every patient. And uh, my task also is now to once again to review what kind of evidence we have and why we personally believe and also many others believe that we need a large scale randomized trial which is um, looking for endpoints. Although the current evidence we have is convincing, but it's not fully convincing, and that is also the reason why at least at least in Germany I see that there are centers who are not, or which are not using the deep, um, any server and pro protection um, in patients with TAVI. So, so my conflict of interest, so you have seen the slide before, so we still have on average roughly 4% of stroke rates, and if you look for the most recent randomized trials comparing um, TAVR versus SAVR, you can see that the stroke rates in TAVR go down, and it seems also to be associated with the risk of the patient um, undergoing TAVR. And as you can see in the most recent partner three and overall low risk, um, the disabling stroke rates were very, very low. Um, this may be also something we have to keep in mind when, when we start planning such a trial. The more low-risk patients you include, um, the lower the risk of um, developing a stroke um, may be. We already have heard about this, table related stroke and predictors. predictors. We have some anatomical factors which have been shown in some trials, but there were also some other trials not showing these anatomical um, factors. This is maybe also one of the reasons why we have a very subjective feeling when we should use cerebral embolic protection, um, because um, there are so divergent and heterogeneous data on anatomical factors which may help us for predicting um, if this patient may develop a stroke. And I just heard, we just heard from Jochen Schofer, um, who was looking for in their 700 patient database where they were not able to find any predictors. So nevertheless, there are some publications out um, saying, okay, this may be a patient with high risk. And we already heard about this um, diffusion-weighted diffusion MRI, so up to 98% of the patient develop um, new lesions in diffusion-weighted MRI. Can't, we do not fully know what this will tell us. At least what we know, the more we have, um, the higher the correlation is to develop a um, significant, clinically significant stroke, and this may also be um, associated with long-term dementia. This is what we have. Um, there's a long um, uh, competitive landscape. We um, have the Claret. We have the, um, what we have already heard, the um, TreeGuard um, HDH. Um, there are many other um, devices um, trying to get to the market. As you can see it here, there are even some more. You can find um, these um, on some websites. I don't want to go into this too, into too, too much detail. You already heard about also this TreeGuard 3 system in the pr two previous talks which is a, um, an evolution of the previous device, which leads to easier deployment and also better um, protection because it better protects all the three branches um, for um, cerebral protection during TAVA procedures. Nevertheless, we now have to look once again back why we also have all these discussions. I know these pros and cons discussions during um, for cerebral embolic protection um, during all these meetings. So once again, looking for Sentinel, what you can see here. Uh, this is a slide what is always shown, that you had a 42% um, reduction. Um, however, the p-value was 0.33. This is, according to my definition, not significant. And this is maybe also why many people say, okay, this is what's the primary study endpoint. Uh, you couldn't show that there's a reduction, a significant reduction in diffusion weighted MRI. Then we have this most recent um, meta analysis, or individual patient level meta analysis published in the um, European Heart Journal, also showing clinically a significant reduction in stroke. However, um, Clean Tavi, which was included, the Sentinel US um, randomized trial was included. 
um, both of these trials did not show a significant reduction in stroke. Um, the, only by adding the Ulm registry, they were able to show a significant reduction. We, we were allowed to write an editorial on this um, publication. And I will show you also one of the um, figures we have included for this analysis. Once again, looking for DFLEX3, you already heard about this, but um, it's, the, it's the first randomized trial, which has been performed with the um, HDH um, tree guard system. Um, also, which I looked it very closely up. Maybe, uh, Alexander, you can comment on this. So the p-value was non-significant for um, diffusion-weighted MRI, and then they did this um, per treatment analysis, and I, but I even couldn't find the p-value um, for this. Um, it said it's significant reduction. Yeah? Um, this is maybe also the reason why some people say, okay, we do not have the strong evidence really to show that we need um, to use cerebral embolic protection in every patient. And you already have seen this, um, this slide before. Um, we do not have the data currently from the phase two trial of the, of the tree guard three versus control, which is a two by one um, randomized trial. We need to, um, to wait for this data. This is from our editorial um, to the Ulm um, individual patient um, data meta-analysis. So what we currently have, we have evidence from registries, we have evidence from pooled analyses. Of our, for, from randomized trials, we currently have no high-grade evidence that we really can reduce stroke if we are using cerebral embolic protection in every patient. And this is maybe also the reason why we have such a heterogeneous landscape also here in this um, auditorium, uh, why not everybody is using it in every patient. This is maybe the problem. That's the reason why what we have been thinking about, and this is how we want to name it, this is uh, so, uh, the acronym for it, so you want to do the choice reflect trial, this is um, tr um, trial design, it will be an investigator initiated European multi-center trial, for sure it must be open label because this cannot be blinded. Um, we want to use the tree guard 3 cerebral embolic protection system, um, patient population for sure is um, clinically indicated TAVR um, with severe aortic stenosis, and then we, we will see if we want to randomize them to in, an intervention group and a control group. Um, this will be done mainly um, by um, our institutions, the Leipzig Heart Institute, at the Heart Center um, Leipzig, at the University of Leipzig, um, me and Mohamed Abdelbahab, and also from France, Nicolas Dumonté will be the PIs. And then we will have the steering committee. And we are currently also figuring out which countries will participate in this trial. Um, and for sure, we will have national coordinators for this trial who will be involved in the steering committee. Data management um, will be done in the United States, and uh, we will get support by Keystone Heart. Um, inclusion criteria are very broad, very easy. We want to have nearly all patients um, undergoing TAVRA, so, which also means nowadays in clinical practice this will be intermediate, high risk, and maybe also low risk patients, um, which is important to consider because as I've shown to you, low risk patients have probably lower risk also for um, developing of stroke, and for sure they need informed consent. Um, exclusion criteria, the typical exclusion criteria, um, also for such a trial, I don't want to go into too much detail into this. Maybe important, this is what we already discussed yesterday, so we want to have a clinical endpoint, cardiovascular mortality or ischemic stroke, which is extremely important within the first 72 hours. So not looking for 30 days, what has been done in the Sentinel trial, um, not looking for um, yeah, longer follow-up because we want to really capture procedural related stroke. And this is what we believe that what we can do with cerebral embolic protection. That's the reason why we, you have to use such an endpoint. We will also look for secondary endpoint for device success, successful placement, cardiovascular mortality within 72 hours, but also in hospital and at 30 days, ischemic stroke also at 30 days, which is important to look for, neurologic dysfunction, which also includes as a secondary endpoint delirium, which is extremely important to assess. Usually this is done by the um, CHEM ICU um, score, which um, is reliable and has been validated in previous trials. For sure, we will also look for procedural details like contrast volume, fluoroscopy time, patient radiation exposure, 
Um, this is important, which will be assessed by the clinical endpoint committee, filter usage um, related vascular access site complications, which is also very important to look for. And then we will also for look for Tavi access site vascular complications. We still not finally settled the sample size, um, but we are close to it um, because this is now the really final step of um, um, discussion. So we probably will need 900 patients in each group to really show a significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality and ischemic stroke within 72 hours. Um, however, this will now be validated by the biostatistician, uh, which is very important to be done. <coughs> Statistical analysis will be done on an intention-to-treat basis, but we will also look for per treatment and a modified um, intention-to-treat analysis, which is extremely important to be done. Um, to uh, assess the robustness of the data. And for sure, we will also do an s treated analysis. Group compression will be done very easy by G-square testing. This is relatively easy, but nevertheless, we will also look for Kaplan-Meier analyses, for time-to-event analyses, in particular for the secondary study endpoints, and also we'll do logistic regression to assess um, predictors of outcome. So this is the current stage, so we still need some work to be to do, so the, I would say the study protocol is 98% finalized, and then we have to do also the contracting with all the European national coordinators to do the trial, but we are very close, and we hope to be the first large-scale randomized trial really showing that cerebral embolic protection is really reducing stroke and cardiovascular mortality, which is extremely important, and I will be fully convinced that this trial will be positive, and in the end, nobody really can say I'm not using cerebral embolic protection anymore. Thank you very much for your attention. This will be a study closure. <laughs> Okay, let me let me actually open it up to the to the group. If there are any questions here, we've had a really nice session um, over the past hour. So, if there are any questions, please come forward. Um, okay, any any comments from? Well, for me, I think it's yeah. it's it's exciting to see that we're now going into the era of definitive trials. Um, it is important, as you say. I think we we believers. Uh, we have seen the evidence grow and grow and grow into the right direction, but we need the big final definitive trials to convince everyone. Um, the major endpoint is stroke. How important do you think is the assessment of stroke, let's say by a neurologist, as opposed to uh, a simple score? I think this is extremely important, and this will be also defined in the study protocol that this must be done by neurologists. I think if you do such a trial, it's not possible to say, okay, this is clinical assessment, this needs to be done. This is also a requirement also by the NeuroArc definition that this needs to be done by a neurologist, and according to our study protocol, for sure, a neurologist will assess um, if the patient may have stroke um, after the procedure or not. I think it's, it's, it's uh, important to have this combined primary endpoint, as I, uh, if I picked it up uh, correctly, um, the combination of cardiovascular mortality and stroke. I think this, this is really very important. Um, we just discussed um, maybe it would be smart uh, not to include low-risk patients in this trial. Yes. Um, it's an issue um, for discussions. Um, totally, totally agree on it. Um, but nevertheless, the majority of patients um, probably will be low risk patients. Based on what we currently do in Germany, it's currently mainly moderate um, to um, or intermediate to high risk patients. And um, yeah, maybe yeah, we can discuss it um, if we really restrict it to it. On the other hand, it's nice to show that you have broad inclusion criteria and that you have more generalizability um, of the data, um, probably this is also important because otherwise afterwards everybody would say, in the lowest patient, I don't need it. Mm -hmm. No, I think that that's a valid point, uh, but I think the, the distribution will come from the distribution of your countries. For example, in the UK, I think it'll take a while until we really go into low risk patients and, and have a, a large number of those. They will be intermediate and high risk, of course. It's the same in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I, th okay, one question. There's yeah. a question come up. Maybe 
Um, so we don't want to have it. Um, so it would be nice to have such a sub-study, diffusion weighted MRI, and such a trial, um, at least according to German regulations, if you would include such a trial. So this would mean um, that you have um, additional um, examinations in this patient. This will automatically lead to different rules or laws that will be then mean that this will be a medical product law um, st study, which makes it much more complicated and um, probably um, this will take two or three years until we get uh, um, all regulatory affairs to be done. That's the reason why we don't want to have it in. It's, I would like to have it from a scientific approach. Yeah? We, that's the reason why we are currently considering if we maybe should use um, Doppler um, assessment if we really can show that in these patients we have no hits um, uh, cere cerebrally. This would be nice to be show um, because this, if you do Doppler, this is not a, an additional um, examination of this patient, but this would probably allow us not to be under the regulatory medical product law in Germany. But this is um, an, an issue uh, which has to be considered in the um, design of the trial. Okay, wonderful. One more question here. I think is the next step, absolutely. But we need to we need to bring this whole story to conclusion and really sort of definitively show the benefit. I think in TAVI, and I think TAVI has been sort of the substrate of patients that we've been evaluating. Once we prove it, then we'll go to you know different populations. But it's a very good question. So we did a, such an MRI, um, cerebral MRI study in patient undergoing a mitral clip procedure, and we also saw in more than 80% of these patients um, having new lesions in diffusion-weighted MRI, even in those patients undergoing mitral clip procedures. So this is for sure it's an option, but currently uh, we do not have any data on this. Left atrial appendage ablation would be another potential yeah. fertile ground. There's many. It's a good question. Okay, you want to wrap this up? I'll wrap it up. So, you know, I, I think uh, for me it's been a long journey, eight good years, fabulous years. I think we've sort of created a field and a, and a need that clearly is a clinical need. And, uh, you know, I have to say that seeing it go from where we started, where there was a lot of skepticism in, in this whole area, to now designing and seeing a definitive trial being, um, you know, put in place, I think is is just tremendous. Um, you know, I see in the room, I recognize a lot of people and different devices that are being developed with, you know, nuances on, on, the, um, on protection. I think it really speaks to, again, treating our patients and avoiding stroke complications after TAVI. So it's very, very gratifying to see this. And I think a story that will continue and uh, <coughs> hopefully we'll be back here at PCR next year and hear the results of REFLECT and the progress on the European study. So thank you very much. I want to thank the speakers, the panelists, my co-chair. Thank you very much.